Good afternoon. Hi, Fred. How are you? Hi, Fred. Ah, Very good. <laughs> excellent. Lovely to see you. Uh, likewise. Where are you today? Are you in Singapore or in London? I'm in Singapore. Um, I've been here for uh, eight months straight, so it's the longest I've ever been really? in Singapore. Yes, it's an extraordinary, actually. How are you? Where, where are you? Um, I'm in Paris right now. You know, I think it's in a year like this where I think back on the memories that I treasure the most. And I and I have to say, I really look back at the time we spent together in Monaco with such fondness and when we could be so convivial. I hope you can come again uh, next year in Monaco. Hopefully the, the Grand Prix will happen. <laughs> with absolute pleasure. And uh, first of all, I haven't seen you since, so a big congratulations uh, on your new role as CEO of Tag Heuer. And uh, I think it's amazing. And I have to say, you've been smashing it this year. You know, I've, I've, it's a big year for you, 160th anniversary, but you've been launching one after the other of absolutely killer watches, so bravo. Thank you very much. It's really a, a teamwork. We have a great teams that have been working on, the, on these watches for, for years. You know how long the development process is in, uh, uh, in, in this industry. Um, and uh, it's also great to see you again. Um, uh, it's, a, it's a pity we didn't have a chance to to talk uh, before uh, this year, huh? Absolutely, um, but it's, you know, we're here together now and it's a real pleasure. Let's talk a little bit about um, what I'm kind of identifying as three main sort of design philosophies related to watches at Tag Heuer. Um, I would say the first are the ones that are, are kind of revivals of some of your most beautiful historic watches. Um, that are really beautiful homages to it. Uh, and I think the best example of that was in the beginning of the year, that silver Carrera that we saw for the 160th anniversary. That was amazing. You know, I, I remember I was in the airport uh, and I saw it and I almost dropped my phone because I was like, you know, that's it. It's, it's stunning. So tell me a little bit about what this watch represents to you from histor uh, historical perspective, but also in terms of your capacity to revive icons. Yes. When we thought of uh, the 160 years uh, anniversary of the brand, uh, we really wanted to have a focus on one uh, collection in particular. And uh, uh, we thought that Carrera was really the one that uh, made most sense. I'd say it is uh, one of the leading names today uh, uh, in our brand and also in the uh, watchmaking industry. Um, and uh, um, uh, to relaunch it, we really wanted to uh, uh, recall the past and look at the, the first versions uh, that made this watch special. And actually, you know, this, uh, this collection, unlike some others, was really successful from the start. Uh, the name was great, the design was great, there was good collections, different models that uh, uh, were very complementary one, one, one to the other. It's a chronograph, which is very important for, uh, for Hoyer at the time and, uh, and Tag Hoyer today. Um, and uh, uh, this watch in particular, we thought was uh, very interesting with the, the color of the dial. Uh, and um, uh, we didn't want to do a strict re-edition, but we really wanted to bring uh, a modern techniques to it. So we have our, our modern movement uh, for your O2. Uh, we have an um, interesting uh, faux patina on the, on the, the hands uh, um, uh, that uh, is sort of a, a modern retro, modern vintage uh, look. Um, and um, it was really to show the anchor of the Carrera in the past. It's a collection that has uh, almost 60 years of, uh, of history. Uh, it's, it's an icon. Very few watches have uh, the status. Absolutely. So, you know, uh, on the subject of the Hoyer O2 movement, which is a fantastic chronograph movement made by you, uh, column wheel, vertical clutch, but you, cre you also used it to create two very interesting Carrera Sports chronographs this year, one in 44 mm and one in 42 mm. And when I initially thought about these watches, I thought perhaps they might be quite similar and actually kind of occupy the same um, category. But then when I looked at them more, I realized actually the 44 mm watch is much more robust and kind of sporty and a little bit aggressive, especially with the ceramic bezel. And then if you look at the 42 mm, it's more kind of an elegant watch as well. It was that the intention to, to have these two offers and do you think they're very complementary? Yes, uh, definitely. I think you summarize uh, very well the, the vision we had for this, uh, for this relaunch. Um, we really uh, wanted to, to recall the top models that were launched in the history. Um, uh, if you look at the first models, it was a, um, a chronograph with a tin bezel with a three compacts uh, 
uh, display. And this is the first time that we bring it again uh, on a classic dial. Uh, we had the Hoyo O2 with the skeleton dial, but it's the first time on the Carrera we bring it again with a, with a, with a classic dial. Um, uh, and on the Sporty, we wanted to recall uh, one of the leading SKUs uh, that was launched in uh, uh, leading models that was launched in uh, 2004. It's actually the first time that an external tachymeter was uh, uh, launched on the, on the Carrera. There was initially some uh, internal tachymeters on the dial, uh, not on the very first ones. The very first ones were really uh, without tachymeters, but later on we saw some internal tachymeters. And in 2004, that's the first time that we saw an external tachymeter. And then it, it started becoming uh, um, uh, one of the iconic looks of the Carrera. You know, this uh, uh, the, the watch we, we recall to is a Caliber 16 uh, black watch that was... Um, um, also nicknamed by the collectors the Brad Pitt watch because at the time uh, Brad Pitt was the, the ambassador of, uh, of, of Ty Coyer, uh, uh and um, it was extremely successful and so we really wanted to refine really these two tastes and flavor in the Carrera um, one more elegant um, uh, and one uh, a bit more sporty with an external tachymeter but there's many details that we changed uh, that we can see in both models so if you don't mind, can we put up a, a picture of the 42mm watch as well? Because I think that the, the, the expression of this watch, while you know, clearly in, in a, a, a alliance with the, the 44mm, actually is completely different. It's a really elegant watch. You know, and, and it was really cool, uh, Frederick, to see guys like Jeff Stein, like Arnold Heislinger, all coming out and saying that they absolutely love this watch. I mean, how did that make you feel? Uh, very proud, very proud of the teams that have been working uh, tirelessly on this on this project uh, for more than uh, more than two years. Um, uh, on, on this one, um, we recall yeah, the disposition of the counters, the legibility of the dial, which was very true for Jack Hoyer. For uh, sorry, Jack Hoyer, uh, we added um, um, small hands for for the. Uh, for the seconds, uh, and this is quite new for the Kaira, and it actually uh, looks quite quite good on the on the dial. Um, on the case, we of course kept the lugs, and the lugs is what makes also this watch uh, special. But we add, added a chamfer from lug to lug, um, uh, recalling also some uh, uh, shapes of uh, of cars. Um, um, we kept the disposition of the pushers. Um, Round pushers. Uh, this is very true to Carrera. You know, we had thoughts. Oh, should we bring some uh, maybe different designs on these pushers? But uh, uh, we always came back to, uh, uh, to to this design. And the steel strap also is quite new. Um, it's a it's a new uh, shape, a new H uh, shape. We really worked on the integration also, so it looks uh, very smooth uh, uh, with the um, with the case. That 42 mm watch is one of the best watches that's been launched this year. I have to say it's almost uh, like perfect in every single detail from the chamfer that you were talking about, from the lugs, from the pushers, from the bracelet, and from the iconography of the dial, which is extremely pure. And I know how difficult it is to design really apparently simple things, but have a very strong pronounced sense of um, identity. Tell me a little bit about um, your work in the creative process, because it, it clearly you are an amazing repository now of, of Tag Boyer information, you know, just start listening to you. <laughs> Well, thank you very much for uh, your kind words on, on, on this watch. Uh, it was very well received by, uh, by clients and uh, we have also positive comments uh, uh, by, by, by journalists, as you mentioned, Jeff Tynes, uh, great collectors uh, uh, for, for the brand. Um, I was implicated since the beginning. Um, first on uh, defining the objectives um, and it was to um, rebring a classic look on the Carrera with our modern uh, movements, in-house uh, manufacturer movements, uh, with uh, um, always improving quality and also perceived quality. Uh, we have this, this trade compacts uh, uh, design as we're calling, and we had discussions on all these topics we mentioned one by one. So we started by, uh, by the case, uh, what should we do? Uh, how should we record the historic codes? And that's when we had the idea of this, this chamfer that was actually not possible at the time in uh, 60 years ago. And it's a uh, uh, new techniques that allow us to uh, to do it smoothly with keeping a very good quality uh, for the watch. Uh, also on the on the on the dial, there was many discussions on the disposition of the indexes uh, of the, the finishing the 
finishings on the on the counters, uh, on the sub dials. Uh, how do we really make this watch modern and actual, but keeping the flavor of what Carrera is and was and is in people's mind? The idea was not to do revolution, uh, and um, um, but to bring something fresh and new. Amazing. And since we're on the subject of the Carrera, let's talk a little bit about the Carrera Sports Chronograph, uh, 160th Special Edition watch, which was just launched uh, about a week ago. Uh, it's a great watch as well. I love how you've taken one element in particular, which is the date, changed the placement of it and, have it in, and having it in red, and it completely changes the identity of this watch as well. Yes. There's many codes we brought. So the, the Panda dial, of course, um, um, of which we have many examples in the history. Um, I really love also the details on the on the, the, the counter, the, the sub counter at three uh, with the, the, the red lines. And this is uh, very unique to, to Hoyer's history. And we can see it also in the, the Carrera Montreal watch that we launched, uh, uh, it was in yellow. Uh, the, the, the red hand and touches of red like this uh, was, was very true to us. Uh, uh, of course, as you mentioned, the, the red date the day that uh, 12 is something we don't see uh, uh, nowadays too much. Uh, and uh, uh, we had it in the past. We thought it was a very cool detail. Uh, and it's actually uh, um, very legible also. Um, so um, yeah, th thanks, for, uh, thanks for your comments on this watch. And we launched it at the date of the Carrera Panamericana. You know, th this was the inspiration for the name. Uh, very dangerous race, iconic race uh, happening in Mexico. Uh, and we launched this watch just at the date of, the, of this race. Amazing. Uh, you know, I have to say, really commend you. You are using vintage elements in contemporary watches and just with just the right balance, right? There's this kind of very beautiful dynamic tension that's happening. I mean, you had mentioned before this idea of a chamfer because you like this line in cars. And usually that line is used to create a tension between the sort of smoother and femin more feminine lines of a car and the more aggressive sort of like vertical lines of a car. Um, this kind of sense of, of, of dynamic contrast is really apparent in the watches you're creating, certainly in the 42mm Carrera, certainly in that 160th um, uh, anniversary sports uh, um, Carrera as well. I mean, bravo, you're, you're using these elements to create a modern identity that is, uh, it's got great retro kind of touches to it, but it's wholly its own um, design philosophy, and I, and I think it's something very important for the future. Um, is is this kind of the idea for the for watches to come? Thank you. We have a fantastic history. Uh, I love spending time in the in the museum, in the archives, uh, and also some some blogs on which I, I discover stuff about the brands. Uh, uh, we have great periods of design, uh, and um, uh, we have to leverage that. It's a, it's a very very uh, a strong element for us. Uh, we have 106 years of, of history. We can we can rely on that. It gives also trust and confidence to uh, the consumers. They know we've been around for this much time. They know that uh, uh, we have real codes that we nurture and which we believe and that makes our watch um, uh, live through time and not, not becoming uh, uh, obsolete. Uh, uh, and so um, this is the spirit, but always making them modern and bringing a modern touch. And also with the techniques, uh, having the latest uh, uh, sapphire glass, uh, having the latest techniques on the movement with the best quality you can find, uh, and improving these elements um, on, on the quality is very important for us. You mentioned being modern and how it's important also for kind of growing the audience uh, of Tag Heuer in terms of also collaborations. And one of the most successful collaborations you've had is with Fujiwara from Fragment. And you create another really cool Fragment watch this year, this year based more on Atavia. Tell us a little bit about these collaborations and what they bring to Tag Heuer. Definitely. So to talk about the, the Hiroshi Fujiwara, so we, we have a great uh, partnership with him. Uh, we, it's the second watch we've actually wanted to him. We did a first uh, Carrera 39 millimeter with uh, quite an innovative strap also for the brand, uh, the, the alligator strap. And there we wanted also to um, maybe push the brand uh, in directions where we've never been. And uh, um, we, we took inspiration from uh, actually a Formula One case, which is our, our entry price watch, uh, usually uh, on, the, on the quartz movement. And we thought, why not try bringing our in-house manufacturer movement in this watch, which was a uh, something we had never done in the past. Um, 
and also redesigning completely a bracelet. So this was a uh, uh, Hiroshi's idea. You know, some of it really came from him. Some of it came uh, from us internally, but it was really a discussion. And I think that's what makes uh, products great. It wasn't just uh, Hiroshi saying, I, I want this, do it. And uh, no, we have also a point of view. And it was really a, uh, a discussion between, between him and us that brought this, uh, th th this product. We know what's great um, in, in, uh, in our brand. He knows uh, uh, what's great in his and uh, what, what point of view he can bring. Um, yeah, the strap, um, the um, finishes we brought on the, on the case. And actually, um, it's from a Formula One, but it also recalls some uh, vintage Otavias from the 70s. Uh, all the finishing on the, on, on the dial, which was uh, printed. We had some, some uh, thoughts of sort of having some, uh, some specific indexes, but uh, uh, we thought uh, collectively that having print printed, uh, full printed dial was, uh, was quite cool and uh, quite, uh, quite new. So, um, and this watch was extremely successful um, uh, in, in Japan, in China, uh, um, th throughout the world. Collaborations will uh, play an important part. And I think uh, um, that's what a watch community wants to see as well. Some, uh, some creativity that we couldn't bring uh, uh, by ourselves. We couldn't do this watch just like Hoyer. We need uh, uh, some external inputs, external brand, external point of view uh, to bring this creativity. Uh, and uh, uh, we'll have uh, some future collaborations in, in, uh, uh, for the brand. Uh, I think um, one of our objectives is really to bring uh, creativity that only Factorier plus another partner could bring. Excellent. Um, since we're talking about bracelets, let's talk a little bit about the 39 millimeter Hoyer O2 driven Monaco with this great integrated bracelet as well. Um, you know, it was so cool to see that. And I know that integrated bracelet watches are a very hot category as well. But when you did it, you did it with great, you know, reference to the past, but also creating something that the audience today, today absolutely wants to wear. Tell us a little bit about this watch. When I joined the, the brand, there was many uh, discussions about the uh, uh, metal strap on the Monaco, and we saw many different uh, versions, and none of, it, of, of which uh, we thought uh, integrated well with the with the watch. I think we need to um, uh, recall some codes of designs we could see on the case, on the on the um, on, on the dial, and uh, uh, to feel the watch as one, and not just we design first the case and then we design a, a, a bracelet. Uh, and with this watch. It's already uh, uh, quite big. Um, uh, the big risk was to, to make it very heavy with, uh, with a steel strap. Um, and um, with iterations, we, uh, we fell on, on this strap. And uh, uh, we believe that uh, we, we've had in, in the past a lot of uh, central uh, connections between uh, for, for, the, for the strap. And it works really, really, really well for the Monaco and also the square shape really recalls the square shape we have on, on, the, on the case, on, on the subcounters. And I think that's what makes it uh, uh, look at, at one watch uh, and not just a, a strap on a, on a case. No, absolutely agree. So let's uh, change up uh, the topic a little bit and talk about uh, the modern world. Um, and I want to get to the connected watch, but first let me just ask you a question related to digitization. Um, I was speaking to my friend, um, Brian Duffy yesterday, uh, who is the CEO of Watches of Switzerland. And he was discussing how that despite a challenging year, still, their results were still very strong. And one of the key differences also was e-commerce. Are you a believer in e-commerce? And for you, what is the future for e-commerce uh, related to your industry? Hmm. Um, personally, and at Tech Warrior, uh, we are strong believers in e-commerce. Uh, um, uh, I think that uh, I mean, the trends in commerce, uh, e-commerce in, in general, not just for the watch industry, is, uh, is, is booming. And uh, it's reinforced even this year with uh, uh, the, the crisis uh, that we know. Um, uh, and we are seeing less and less barriers in buying, purchasing a watch online. Um, um, uh, when I joined, I, uh, we really put as a first priority uh, the redesign of our website. I think it has to be our number one flagship. That's where we have the most traffic. That's where we want to bring the best expression of the brand, the best expression of our collections. We invested a lot on the, um, uh, the representation of the products. So we have a great uh, uh, 3D visuals uh, that can make you uh, um, uh, feel as if you had a watch uh, in front of you. 
and, and people more and more want the ease of uh, purchasing online. Uh, um, sometimes they can access easily a, a point of sale uh, um, and, and they are used more and more to purchasing online. I think it's a complementary service to an offline distribution. Um, uh, but today it's still very small in penetration compared to, uh, to other industries. I believe it will grow uh, still by a lot. And we need to bring services. I mean, we're investing a lot right now on uh, how to bring a human touch online, uh, how to make sure, okay, when you are browsing, you can have uh, easily contact with a sales advisor that uh, will uh, uh, be able to give you the, the best advice uh, for you as a customer as you would have uh, in a boutique. Because we say, okay, in a boutique, human contact is very important. It is, but we can also bring this human contact online. And uh, uh, it's, it's a question of organization. It's a question of, of investment. And um, uh, customers are, are more and more wanting this type of service. I totally agree with you. I think one of the byproducts of 2020 will be we are so now used to having these kind of conference calls that actually this interface will work brilliantly between an actual salesperson and an actual client as well. And so I commend you for uh, shifting into to incorporating that. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the connected watch. Now, at this point, this is a, a really evolved product in terms of its quality, right? Um, you've got uh, steel, titanium options, a ceramic bezel, a sapphire crystal. Um, and it's also from a price perspective um, at 1,700 euros, a luxury object. Who is the consumer or the buyer for this type of connected luxury sports watch? So um, we had a target audience and then uh, an audience that we observe. And uh, of course, like on many uh, launches, uh, there, there's some of the target audience we had right, some of it that we discovered uh, and we hadn't necessarily thought of. So first, it's the tag for your fans. Um, uh, people who own a, a few tag warriors who love the brand and uh, who are interested in uh, um, this type of technologies. Uh, but we have a lot of customer acquisition with this watch. More than 60% of uh, people purchasing this watch, uh, it's the first tag warrior for them and they were not necessarily purchasing a, um, a watch from us uh, before. Um, we have um, watch fans and watch collectors uh, who have a, um, a, a strong collection and uh, uh, who uh, wouldn't want to uh, compromise on the aesthetics and uh, what they love in watches when they have a, a, a small watch uh, on their wrist. And uh, we invested a lot on the materials, um, um, stainless steel, titanium, we have a great ceramic bezel, uh, the straps, the tangibility of the strap, the versatility. When you have this watch on, um, um, it, it's, it could feel as if you had a, a mechanical watch in some aspects. And uh, so a lot of customers really, really value that. Uh, then we have some specific audience. One of them is a um, golfer. Uh, we have, uh, we've invested a lot on this watch uh, with, on, um, on software. And I believe success in this category comes from the alliance of mechanical engineering and design, hardware engineering and design, software engineering and design, and services. So there's extra complexity that comes with, uh, uh, with this product, but we have, we have a vision on all of that. And um, we've invested a lot on use cases and, and, and software, building our own ecosystem, uh, focused for now really on sports. And uh, Tag Heuer is so relevant in the world of sports. And uh, uh, sports is um, uh, very useful. Measuring sports performance on the, on the watch uh, is something that's becoming more and more common. You know, we have uh, extra sensors, uh, GPS, heart rate monitor, uh, and um, uh, we saw golf as a great opportunity. Uh, we have our own uh, app, uh, and it's really uh, the leading experience uh, on the watch. We have inter interactive uh, um, display with uh, the shape of the golf course. You can see with our own 3D maps. You know, we have a, a database of all the golf courses uh, in the world, uh, and this is performing uh, very, very well. Um, golf is really one of our leading sports, but we also invested on the more mainstream sports uh, like running fitness, uh, and uh, we have a strong roadmap with dedicated teams internally working on that. Amazing. Um, 
I know you're a very busy man, so I've just got two more questions for you. So uh, I have the pleasure of following you on Instagram, and I know that you're you're quite a consummate sportsman. I think I've seen you do some like kite surfing, or, uh, which would look very impressive. And, and I also know you're you're uh, an extraordinary pianist as well. So in your own life, how are you using the connected watch? Like, it, what? It, well, how would you in integrate it into your sort of your routine? Hmm. So definitely, it's a companion uh, during sports activities. I run uh, once or twice a week. Uh, I started golf actually after the confinement. And uh, one of the reasons was uh, because we had a product in golf and I thought it, <laughs> I, I, had, I had to use it in, in, in real life <laughs> to be able also to challenge the teams on the, the product we were building. Uh, so in, 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 on the golf course, of course, uh, but a lot on the, my day to day. Uh, and that's what's great with this watch. It's not just a sports watch and it's really a watch that accompanies you in the, the day to day. Um, simple use cases like notifications. Um, I love changing the dial very often. You know, we have uh, so many different configurations uh, and uh, great creativity to come also on the watch faces. Um, the latest one we launched was the, the Helios watch face, uh, which is an uh, inspiration again from uh, uh, vintage carreras, but we reinterpreted the counters and now bringing them completely digital. And you can have a... Uh, um, do a GMT or a sunset, sunrise, or even the weather that's completely designed by us. And uh, I think that the design looks really great. And it's, uh, um, I love ch changing the dials and uh, the, the expression on, on the watch very often. And yeah, simple uh, use cases like uh, uh, notifications, seeing my next uh, appointment um, um, on, on the day-to-day -day business life, uh, I find that very useful. Awesome. Uh, great answer. And uh, uh, last question. Um, you are celebrating your 160th anniversary this year for Tag Heuer. Um, as the man who is now guiding this brand into the future, what would you like to see happen to the brand over its next 160 years? So I, um, I think 160 years is a very long, long time. <laughs> and uh, we're not thinking in the brand 106 years ahead. We really are thinking um, that everything we do should last uh, and should last through times, but already decades is, uh, uh, is, is long enough. Um, uh, now, um, what we're looking uh, is that this brand is one of the leading brands in watchmaking and it should stay one of the leading brands in watchmaking. Uh, for that, it has to be true to what it was, but it also shouldn't be afraid of reinventing itself. Uh, and. Uh, uh, finding new milestones uh, of things we can do in 2020 we couldn't do before in terms of innovation, in terms of creativity, and building uh, new mi milestones for the brand. Uh, one of the ambitions we have is to really continue building founding acts for the brand today. Uh, you know, the founding acts, there's the, uh, the foundation of the brand. Uh, when it was in 1960, founded by Edouard Hoyer, there's some key innovations that came. There's also the... Um, Hoyer becomes Tag Hoyer, which is a great moment for the brand. And you know, people uh, today know the brand a lot as Tag as well. Huh? When you go in the, in the United States, people talk a lot, a lot about Tag and Tag brings a lot of, of flavor to the brand. It's te technique d'avant-garde. Uh, uh, the innovation, the avant-garde is really in, in, in the name. Um, the ambition we have is that we will, uh, in this decade, um, bring continue building some funding acts that will uh, uh, bring the brand the brand forward. Very cool. Well, Frederick, thank you so much. I mean, you've done a great job this year. Uh, we're looking forward to what happens in the years ahead. I hope to get to see you in person uh, pretty soon. Uh, I would look forward to that and I uh, appreciate your sharing your time with us, my friend. Thank you, Wei. It was great, uh, great discussion. I really love uh, your background. <laughs> Well, let's do more. Oh, yeah. <laughs> These are all the bespoke shoes that I made that I haven't used at all this year. So I might as well just put them there. <laughs> Great. All right. Thank you very much. Thanks. Have a lovely day. Bye. Cheers. Bye.